r slash no sleep posted by you slash horror underscore writer underscore 1717 i'm a firefighter and what i found in the last fire creeped me out there was a notebook that survived the last fire i was called to i found it in the smoldering remains of the ashes i'm not sure if i believe the story in it or not but i thought i would share it just in case it's real mama said there'd be days like this it's a nice thought isn't it it speaks of a concerned parent trying to comfort her child to the harsh realities of the world. The problem is, I don't recall my mama ever saying anything like that to me. Even if she had, I don't think in her wildest nightmare she could have imagined a day like that one. The day I leaned against the inside of a train tunnel, soaked in sweat and grime, staring at the train tracks that dripped with the blood of my friend, blood that should have been mine. My name is Joe. I don't think I'm named after anybody, mama just always called me Joe. There are lots of things that mama always just did, like beating the tar out of me when I sassed her, beating the tar out of me if I didn't kill anything for supper, beating the tar out of me the day I told her I wanted to learn to read. At this point, you wouldn't think I had much tar left in me, but you couldn't tell mama that. She was a big woman and I think beating me made her feel better about herself. I grew up in a little shack in the middle of nowhere. Mama always called it a cabin, but it was really just four walls and a roof, hastily put together with stolen boards and nails from an old barn down the road. Mama always told me that she took good care of me. Of course, she told me that the cabin was a huge house and that learning was bad. I guess in a way it was, for her. I wasn't allowed to have picture books or anything like that. I'll teach you everything you need to know, Mama said. That's what I call a half-truth. She taught me everything she needed me to know. Like how to cook, clean, cut firewood and take care of her when she was sick. Anything other than that was on Mama's forbidden list. How does all this lead to a boy watching his friend being horribly dismembered by a speeding train? Stick with me for a little bit, we'll get there. Mama didn't have a job. We hunted and grew food. Once a month, the two of us would drag our small, rickety cart to a truck stop on the outskirts of Larson, 15 miles away. We would set up alongside the road, selling homegrown vegetables during the day. Mama never let me see or talk to any of the people. They ain't no good, she said. And I don't want you taken after them. Mama had a special word for the people who lived in any town, Air Gant. I didn't know what it meant at the time, but found out later that it meant folks who don't see things the same as Mama. At night, we would go shopping in dumpsters. The next day, we would head back home with a few dollars in Mama's pockets, and a cart full of treasures. Frost Creek was only two miles from the cabin, but to reach it, you had to walk through a railroad tunnel. Yet another thing that was on Mama's forbidden list. That tunnel took your daddy away from me, I ain't gonna let it take you too, she said. The funny thing about curiosity is, you can bottle it up, but once it's out, there ain't no way of getting it back in. I found an old children's dictionary on one of our trips. You remember the kind that had the pictures beside the words. Well, I started looking at that book, and before you know it, the stopper was out of my bottle. I lost a lot of tar the day mama caught me with it. We ain't reading folk. She screamed as she beat me. Nothing in that book is gonna put food on the table. But being young, dumb, and, well, whatever, I snuck the book away from her and hid it. This was the beginning of my new life. Isn't it funny how when you latch onto something new, the old just doesn't quite cut it anymore? There was a large, empty cave where I hid my treasures. The few children's books that I had snuck home, my dictionary, and a pair of dress shoes that actually fit. I struggled to read the books, relying heavily on the pictures. My favorite was the one that told me about Halloween, Christmas, and Thanksgiving. Halloween was my favorite. The thought of getting all that candy just for putting on a costume made me feel excited. I planned my first trick-or-treat trip very carefully. I told Mama I would be gone most of the day and into the night, picking her favorite berries. Which were already picked and hidden in my cave, she knew it was a long, dangerous way to the patch where those berries grew. She wanted to tell me no, but I could see the hunger in her eyes. It's funny how desire can override concern. Having gotten her blessing, I went to my cave, put on my dress shoes, ragged jeans, and shirt. I wrapped my supper in a red bandana and hung it at the end of a stick. With my outfit complete, I walked down to the railroad tracks and stared at the tunnel. The sun was just starting to set, bathing it in an eerie red glow. The stones that formed the opening looked like giant bloody teeth, just waiting to eat me. Mama always told me there was evil that lurked in that tunnel. I used to think she was just trying to scare me to keep me out, but that evening, things were different. As I stepped into the dark, I felt the wickedness inside me, like I knew I was doing wrong but didn't care. I ate my supper as I walked through the tunnel, leaving the bandana nearly empty. When I came out on the other side, 
the world had been transformed. Everywhere I looked were bright shining lights, and people hurrying this way and that. I stopped and stared at a giant yellow M. The smells that came from inside made my mouth water. Someday I'll be rich enough to eat there. Mama wouldn't like that, I argued with myself. I dragged myself away from the site and started down a street that on any other night would have seemed bizarre beyond description, yet tonight it was the greatest thing I had ever seen. I smiled from ear to ear as ghosts holding plastic pumpkins floated by. Next was a trio of miniature superheroes arguing over which one had the most candy. I walked up to the first house I saw and knocked on the door. The porch light came on, and an old man flung open the door. What? He snarled. Trick or treat, I said, holding out my bandana. The old man glared at me. Do you see my porch light on? He said. Yes, I said, looking up. The old man looked up too, and harumphed, as several more trick-or-treaters were drawn toward the light, like brightly colored insects. He quickly turned the light off, and they drifted away. You see that, boy? The old man said, pointing toward the other houses. All those idiots with their porch lights on? Yes. Those are the ones you go to for your satanic, pagan candy. Not understanding the word satanic, or pagan, I turned to leave, but the old man held me back. I do have a treat for you though, he said with a wicked grin. Since you were kind enough to wake me up. Wait here. The old man disappeared and reappeared quick enough to be a magician. Here you go, he said, holding out a rotten banana. I took it, and tears welled up in my eyes. Thank you, I said, hugging him, it was the last thing he expected. He pulled away from me, harumphed, and slammed the door in my face. I peeled the banana and ate it as I walked toward the next house, making sure the porch light was on. As I started up the walkway, I finished the banana, and tossed the peel in the yard. A large man in his mid-thirties stood on the lighted porch, holding a bowl of candy and frowning as I approached. Trick or treat, I said, holding out my bandana. Are you going to throw that away? The man said, gruffly. I looked at my bandana, seeing no reason why I should throw it away. No, not the bandana, the man said. The banana. He pointed to the discarded peel I had thrown into his yard. I picked it up and looked at the large man. Trash can, he said, pointing toward the street. I walked out and saw a can sitting beside a streetlight, looked at the man, and pointed towards the can. He nodded his approval, and I threw the peel in, then walked away. Hey! Called the large man. Don't you want any candy? I ran back to the porch, looked into the bowl filled with colorful wrappers, and grabbed a handful. Only take two, the man said. It's still early, I need to have some for the other kids. I hesitated, then picked the two that had the most interesting wrappers. Didn't your parents ever teach you not to litter? The man asked. Not understanding the word litter, I bluffed by nodding my head. Where are they anyway? The man said. Who? Your parents. Daddy's gone, and mama's at home, I said. Your mother let you go trick or treating by yourself? The man said with an edge in his voice. Sensing that I had done something wrong, I said, I gotta go. Then I ran across the street and hid behind a tree. Maybe I should just give up and go home. I pulled out one of the pieces of candy, opened it, and took a bite. My mouth exploded with sweetness. I gobbled it and the next piece right away. I could feel the blood rushing through my body. The sudden burst of energy dragged me to the next house. The lady smiled and complimented my hobo suit, then gave me three pieces of candy which I devoured as soon as I got out of sight. The rest of the evening was more of the same, polite smiles and lots of candy. My bandana never got a chance to fill up. An hour later, I headed back out of town, moving a lot slower. My stomach began to feel strange and make sounds I had never heard it make. I stopped at the trash can I had thrown my banana peel into, and suddenly upchucked all the candy I had eaten. The large man came outside and watched me heaving into the trash can. You okay? He asked. Yeah. I said, breathing hard. Here, he said, handing me some paper towels. Clean yourself up, and follow me. He waited for me to finish, then started walking toward the middle of town. I followed him until we came to a building with a large star on the front of it. I hesitated. Come on in, the man said. It's okay. The large man walked inside, closely followed by me. Evening, Sheriff, said a man behind a raised counter. Who's your friend? What is your name, boy? The sheriff asked. Um, Joe. Joe what? Just Joe. But, what's your last name? I don't understand, I said. 
My mama always called me Joe. Okay, what's your mama's name? Mama, I said, confused. Joe mama? The man at the desk said. Really? The sheriff chuckled a little. Okay kid, let's get you cleaned up. Follow me. He took me to the back hallway, where the cells were. I got nervous right away. Don't worry, kid. I'm just letting you shower and get some clean clothes. After I showered and changed, he brought me back out, took my picture and prints. Let's run them against the National Runaway Network, he told the deputy. Sure thing, boss. Nothing came back. Joe, how long have you been living on the street? The sheriff asked. I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. Where does your mother live? Once again, I was silent. Think I know exactly what you need to loosen the tongue of yours. Come on. He left the station, with me tagging along carrying my old clothes. How's your stomach feeling? He asked. A little better, I said. Good, because we're here. It was a large, two-story brick house. I could see from the street lamp, that the house was well kept. When the woman answered the door, she seemed familiar. Hello, Sheriff, she said, cheerfully. Hello, Marcy. I have someone for you to meet. We've already met, she said, smiling. He was dressed like a hobo. Well, I'm not sure it was a costume. I think he's a runaway. She shook her head and made a sad, clucking sound. Come on in. I've got to get going if it's all the same to you. Sure, Sheriff, she said. You know our door is always open. Thanks, Marcy. I'll send the paperwork over for Joe in the morning. Sounds good, thanks. You take care kid, he told me. You're in good hands here. I'll see you around. Thank you, sir, I said. He laughed. You can call me Ted. Then he nodded and walked away. Marcy showed me my room, apologizing for how small it was. Little did she know it was nearly the same size as the shack I lived in with mama. I laid down on the soft bed and fell instantly asleep. I woke with a start and panicked. Alone in a huge room, I didn't recognize, surrounded by comforts I never had at home. I jumped out of bed, threw on my old clothes, and snuck out of the bedroom window. I headed back toward the tunnel, with dawn about an hour away, feeling guilty for leaving mama to begin with. But Marcy seemed so friendly, and the bed was so soft. By the time I reached the tunnel, my mind was in an all-out war with itself over which place to call home. Lost in thought, I wasn't paying attention to where I was and had meandered into the tunnel. Instead of going through it as quickly as I could, I kicked rocks and pondered life. Ray was the closest thing I had to a friend. He lived in a shack two hollows up from the one I lived in. He was born with only one working arm. The other one just wasn't there. One tiny finger grew out of his shoulder. It was the weirdest thing I ever saw. Ray didn't talk either. He only had a stump for a tongue. I never knew if he was born that way or if he said something real bad to his daddy. I never knew how old Ray was. He was full grown when I was still toddling around the shack, but he always had the brain of a child. Sometimes when I would go dumpster shopping I would bring Ray back an old, beat up action figure that someone had tossed out. He loved playing with them, but the first thing he did with each one was tear off the right arm. I guess he thought it made them more like him. Ray loved the trains. Every time I saw him, it was somewhere near the tracks. Tonight was no exception. The hum grew steadily louder. The air itself seemed charged with electricity. The ground shook, as I stood frozen by fear and indecision. The deafening scream of the horn jolted me into action. As I ran, the realization washed over me that I was about to die horribly. I stumbled blindly into the powerful light, helpless and lost. Suddenly a hand grabbed me, yanked me back from the tracks, and shoved me into the emergency cutout as the train careened past. The wind from the passing train made me cover my face. Once the train had passed, I looked around to see who my savior was, but no one was there. I slowly stepped out of the cutout and looked around. Ten yards away, sitting in between the tracks was a colorful piece of plastic. I picked it up. It was a dirty action figure with one of its arms ripped off. Oh my god, Ray. I looked down and saw a small splatter of blood. As I followed the tracks to the opening of the tunnel, it intensified. By the time I tasted fresh air, the rails looked like the floor of a slaughterhouse. So that's how I came to be there, watching my friend's blood drip down off the cold steel rails. The noblest, self-sacrificing act I had ever witnessed and I was the only one who knew about it. If that was the end of the story most of you would just sadly shake your head and move on. But the story was just beginning. I stood at a crossroads in my young life. 
If I went back home and told mama what happened I would lose a lot of tar for going through the tunnel and lying to her. If I just up and left, mama would come looking for me. And God knows what would happen if she found me. I ran to my cave, threw all of my important things in a ratty old backpack, then ran back to the tunnel. Next, I took the basket full of berries, threw them here and there, anywhere there was blood, then sat the basket in the middle of the tracks and waited. I could just see in the light as dawn began to fight off the darkness. Joe! Came Mama's voice. I froze. I didn't think she could see me, she was probably just calling out hoping I was close enough to hear her. My resolve waned every time she called my name. Finally, I saw two lights. One was Mama's old hurricane lamp, and the other was an oncoming train. My heart leapt and failed at the same time. The train approached quickly, its horn nearly deafened me. It drove into the tunnel, destroying the basket. As soon as it passed, I ran through. Just as I came out, the lamp appeared at the other end. I slowly peeked around the corner and could barely make out the silhouette of a woman on her knees between the tracks. She was rocking back and forth, holding something in her arms. Finally, I realized it was the remains of the basket. My heart nearly failed me. I wanted to run back to her, and tell her it was alright. I took half a step forward, then remembered Ray. Not wanting his sacrifice to be in vain, I quickly turned my back on the tunnel and started toward town. Ten minutes later I climbed back into the open bedroom window, closed it behind me, and turned around to see Marcy standing there with her arms folded. That's strike one, she said firmly. You never leave this house without asking first. Sorry, I said, hanging my head. Well, come on then and get some breakfast. That's it? What else were you expecting? A beating. Who beat you? Marcy asked, her eyes moist with sympathy. Mama, I said, shrugging my shoulders. She hugged me tightly, and whispered, I will never beat you. She suddenly released me, and went downstairs, dabbing at her eyes. I followed and ate the largest breakfast I'd ever had. It didn't take long for me to start thinking I had picked the right household, the year was full of ups and downs. Marcy and her kids, Paul and Sharon, not only welcomed me into their house, they took me on as their pet project. I had never heard the phrase, foster family before. Within six months I had caught up on years of neglect and was able to go to school only one grade lower than my age bracket. They rallied around me as their cause, and we became a true family like I had never known. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Next Halloween, I went trick or treating again. Sharon had just turned 14 and decided that she was too mature for trick or treating. Paul and I had dressed up as pirates and went together, but got separated in a crowd of costumes. As I looked for him, I realized how close I was to the tunnel. Hesitantly I went over and peered into it. To my surprise, I saw a woman silhouetted kneeling in the middle of the tracks, holding a basket as she rocked back and forth. Mama? I whispered. Somehow the figure heard me. The silhouette looked up, straight at me. Without knowing why, I felt a sudden chill run up my spine. The figure stood and began to walk slowly toward me. I was drawn towards it, and started into the tunnel. Instead of being overwhelmed with relief and love, I felt as if I was suffocating. Suddenly the figure disappeared. Once again, my curiosity had overwhelmed my common sense. I strained my eyes to see where the figure had gone. I pulled out a small flashlight and shone it around the tunnel. My shadow seemed bigger. I shone the flashlight on it, but it didn't go away. The light just disappeared into it, like an empty abyss that even light couldn't escape from. Then I realized that it wasn't my shadow, it was Mama's. As I looked, the air became heavy and hard to breathe. I felt a presence behind me, and heard the word, Joe, whispered in my ear. I panicked and froze. The dark figure came closer. I felt like I was suffocating. An icy tendril touched my face, breaking me out of my stupor. I ran with all my might. Before I knew it, I was back home. I slammed the door and leaned against it, shaking. It's about time you got home. Paul and I were about to go looking for you, Marcy called from the kitchen. How was trick or treating? I had to focus to slow my breathing. Fine, I said, to buy a few precious moments to recover. Well, I made a pumpkin pie, but I'm sure you ate half your candy already, she said. Yeah, I'm kinda tired. I'm gonna go to bed. She smiled that warm smile that let me know everything would be okay. Good night sweetie. A few hours later, I was having a wonderful, sugar-fueled dream about diving into a swimming pool full of candy, when my dream went dark. I felt so cold that I tried to snuggle up in my blanket but it didn't warm me. I opened my eyes to find the room totally black. No lights at all. I looked around to try to get my bearings and saw a shadow beside the bed move on its own. 
It reached out for me but I recoiled. Joe, it whispered. Mama? I slowly reached toward it. It felt like liquid ice running over my hand. Home, it said, looking out the window toward the tunnel. I looked where it was pointing. No, Mama, this is my home now. The shadow drew back as Marcy stumbled into my room, half asleep. What's wrong, honey? Is all that sugar? She stopped dead when she saw the shadow hovering over me. This is my new mama, I said. She treated me good, taught me to read, and she never once beat me. The shadow seemed to consider this. Joe? Marcy whispered to me without taking her eyes off the shadow. I'll explain later, I whispered back. The shadow whispered, blood. Black tendrils shot into Marcy's ears. She screamed but was silenced when the shadow filled her mouth and eyes from the inside, making her look like a living skull. I have no idea the kind of hell she was going through on the inside, but outside, her body was flailing around uncontrollably. Blood flew as she smashed herself against walls as though looking for an escape that she could never find. Stop it, mama. I screamed, but dared not make a move for fear of being pummeled by Marcy. Finally, the tendrils came out of Marcy's ears and she collapsed in a bloody heap. Paul and Sharon wandered into the room rubbing their eyes. What's all the commotion? Sharon was cut short by the sight of the blood and her mother face down on the floor. Mom. She and Paul yelled, running towards her as the shadow reached for them. No, Mama. I dove toward the shadow, trying to tackle it or stop it somehow, but my body passed right through. It felt as if my very soul was frozen. I crashed to the floor on the other side, knocking over most of my possessions. I watched in horror as the tendrils penetrated their ears. The looks of terror and betrayal on their faces are something I've never forgotten as the shadow turned them into bloody, struggling puppets as well. They slumped to the floor of my destroyed bedroom as I lost consciousness. I woke to a strange combination of hot and cold. The shadow brushing my cheek gave me shivers while flames licked the walls of my room. I looked around and saw my portable heater laying face down, still running. Its red-hot coils had caught the carpet on fire and the flames had spread like the flu in an elementary school. The fire surrounded me. I glanced over at the three mangled bodies that hadn't moved. I panicked and jumped through the window as the flames converged, landed on the grass in the cool night air, then turned back to watch the fire devour what was my home and family. Home, the shadow whispered in my ear. No, mama, you destroyed my home. Home, it hissed, while tendrils hovered next to my ears. Go ahead. I would rather die than go back with you. It hovered there as the mournful wail of fire trucks sounded in the distance. I reached out to the shadow. Let me live my life, mama, when it's done, I swear I'll come home. The tendril encompassed my hand as I fought the urge to pull away. Just when I thought I would get frostbite, the shadow evaporated. I collapsed onto the wet grass and stared at the flames as they climbed high into the night sky. The smell of plastic and wood burning made me feel like my own flesh was burning off of my bones, leaving me dead inside. The mournful wail ended as the fire trucks pulled up and bathed the neighborhood in flashing red light. One of the firemen guided me away from the house, sat me on the curb, and threw a blanket over my shoulders. Slowly they got control of the fire. The angry orange flames were quenched like my hopes and dreams of a normal life. I watched as three gurneys, each holding a body, were wheeled out of what was left of the house. They each bypassed the ambulance and went straight to the coroner's van. I sat silently, staring at the ground. Joe? Ted said. My eyes didn't move, didn't blink. Questions flew from everywhere. The EMT, the sheriff, the judge, the jury, I didn't dare tell any of them the truth. After the trial, Ted drove me to my new home. We pulled up to a huge brick building, surrounded by fences covered in razor wire. The sign in front said, Larson Mental Institute. The gate opened and he drove inside. After he parked, he slumped forward against the steering wheel for a moment, then let out a long sigh. Look kid, if you do get better, I'll bring you back. I promise. Four orderlies came out and took me inside. I'd like to say that my time at the institute was helpful and productive. I'd like to say that I learned a lot and came out a better person. I'd like to say that Ted was as good as his word and came to get me when my time was up. As a wise man once said, two out of three ain't bad. I've written more journals about the other things that have happened to me in my life, but there's still a little more left to this story. 50 years later. Grandpa, did that story really happen? Emily said, looking up into my face. Of course it did, I said. Are you calling your grandpa a liar? No sir, she said. But whatever happened to that boy? He got better, 
grew up, got married, and had a wonderful family, I said, smiling. Okay, honey, Joe Jr. said. It's getting late, we better get going. Emily hugged me and got down off of my lap. Look at me, Grandpa, I'm a princess, she said, twirling in a circle. And a beautiful princess too, I said. I hope you get lots of candy this year. Here's some to get you started. Then I put a handful of candy in the little plastic pumpkin she was carrying. She smiled and kissed me on the cheek, then skipped to the car. Well, we're gonna get going, Joe Jr. said. Lots of trick or treating to do. I can't believe she's in second grade already. Where does the time go? Joe Jr. said, looking at his watch. Where indeed? I said, looking at Joe Jr. Are you sure you won't come live with us? Mom's been gone for over a year now. You know I can't do that. I made a promise. Please, Dad, not this again, Joe Jr. said, putting his face in his hands. I thought they cured you of this at the Institute. Aren't you taking your meds? I smiled, but there was no warmth in it. Son, they can't cure my problem with medication. I pulled out a pocket knife and started to whittle. Joe Jr. just bowed his head in resignation. Okay, love you, Dad. Love you too, son. Emily waved as they drove their new SUV over the dirt road that crossed the tracks and started the long, winding trip toward town. I watched them go as I whittled absently. The red, orange, and yellow leaves had given way to the dull browns. Soon winter would rear its ugly head. I smiled as I looked at the empty woodpile with a complete lack of concern. My jaw clenched as the air around me grew heavy. A shadow appeared in the chair. I continued to whittle, trying my best to appear as if its presence didn't disturb me. The shadow reached its hand over and gently laid it on top of mine. Home, it whispered. Yes, mama, I'm home. I smiled, ignoring the chills that shot up my arm, sat down the piece of what I had been carving into a train engine, picked up my pipe, packed it with tobacco, and lit it. I took a long draw on it and watched the match continue to burn. The flame seemed to mesmerize me as if staring at a microcosm of my entire life in that tiny glowing chemical reaction. I barely ever smoked, but today was different, today was a special day. As the flame burned down to my fingers, I dropped the match on top of the pile of whittled wood shavings, then got up and went inside. The recommended dosage for my sleeping pills was two as needed. I took two dozen and swallowed them with a glass of water. As I write these last words that I will ever write, I just wanted to say a few goodbyes. To Ray, thank you for sacrificing your life to save mine. To Ted, thank you for giving me a new one. And to Mama, burn in hell, just like I will. I laid down on the old, worn cot, and looked around the cabin one last time. Night, Mama, I mumbled to the shadow. The shadow caressed my face, causing me to shiver. I laid my notebook down, set it in a bucket and placed a blanket on top of it. Fire crews worked through the night to control the blaze before it became a full-blown forest fire. Once it was out, they investigated the cause. They found the remains of the cabin and the remains of Joe. The fire had started on the front porch beside what was left of a wooden chair. There wasn't much left to identify, except a notebook that had been covered up in a bucket. The very notebook I'm reading this story from. As they searched, they also found two graves. One was freshly dug and empty. The markers were badly burned, but still legible. The first one said, Mama, and the second marker said, Joe, followed by a short passage. Death, where is thy sting?